Good evening, everybody. My name is Bridget Bray, and I'm the Nancy C. Allen Curator and Director of Exhibitions at Asia Society Texas. Thank you so much for making time to be with us tonight. We have a wonderful program in store for you. Um, during this time of isolation, artists Tiffany Chung and Kem Yasuda have been talking about their daily lives, what they think, what they do, and what this time means for the future of artists. Tiffany developed writing prompts based on the form of haiku, which start with the phrase, while the world stands still. The haiku are about the inspiration she's found, which reflect the intellectual and creative processes of her practice. In response, Kim has developed a project for and with her students called the Soundscapes of Lockdown, which embodies her emphasis on combining her artistic and pedagogical practices. Thank you for joining us for this conversation as these two fantastic artists share their insights and questions regarding work during a time of global uncertainty. I was first able to present Tiffany's work at Asia Society Texas in the exhibition we organized called New Cartographies. In our ongoing conversations about current events, Tiffany and I began to talk about her work in this new mode and her longstanding wish to collaborate with Kim. I will briefly introduce both artists and then Tiffany will begin with her presentation, followed by Kim's, and then we will move on to conversation between the two artists and your participation in our Q&A. Tiffany Chung is internationally noted for her research-based multimedia installations and meticulously detailed cartographic works that examine conflict, migration, urban transformation, and environmental impact in relation to the history of specific places. She recently presented a major solo exhibition at the Smithsonian American Art Museum entitled Tiffany Chung, Past is Prologue in 2019. And for more details on her biography, please visit our website. Kim Yasuda is an artist and professor of public practice in the Department of Art at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her work investigates the role of art, artists, and educational institutions in community development and civic life. Her current research intersects her university teaching with her public art practice, shaping pedagogical experiments that explore the intersection between institutional knowledge, production, and the creative practice. Her past exhibition work has been presented at museums such as the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, the MIT List Visual Arts Center in Cambridge and the Art Gallery of Ontario in Canada. With that brief introduction out of the way, I'd like to welcome Tiffany and Kim to the program and uh, please take it away, Tiffany. Thanks, Bridget. Hi, Kim. The, um, I would like to thank to Bridget and Asia Society for having us here. Um, also, thank you. Uh, thanks to the audience for joining as in this uh, webcast. Uh, Kim Yasuda um, is my former professor and mentor who brought me to the University of California in Santa Barbara over 20 years ago. And we always wanted to collaborate but couldn't figure out how to begin. Then the pandemic hit and all of us have been stuck at home. Um, so Kim and I started talking and sharing our thoughts, daily activities and what means for the future of institutions and artists. So um, as mentioned earlier, you know, I sent her some of my writing in the form of haiku with a prompt while the world stands still. She responded and uh, the back and forth conversation uh, through writing, revising and thinking together is quite helpful in processing all that have been happening. So this webcast is um, the first iteration of our collaboration. So we'll each read our own writing written during this time accompanied by related images and afterward we'll converse with each other.
As choreographed, achingly and awkwardly, we step left and right, we move up and down in a quagmire of progress, of ruins and rubble. Tomorrow is here, the angel of history awakens the dead. As our world has descended into surreal and crumbling situations this spring, we've had to accept all the changes and adapt quickly to a new normal. We are forced to enter a new era, which feels very much just overnight. Even when we still haven't quite grasped hold of our new realities and understood the emotional impact, we are witnessing global history in the making. And in fact, we're writing it. As I reflect all of this, I revisit the two works that I shot in 2011, entitled Thousands of Years Before and After, and When the Sun Comes Out, The Night Vanishes, which depict the post-apocalyptic landscape, alluding to the collapse of modern society and of humankind. However, in you know, both films show a group of human survivors wandering in this epic landscape, probably in search of a new home. This gives us a thin ray of hope that perhaps the end is also the beginning and that nature continues to run its course. While the world stands still, my dog runs and smells the spring. Mom's garden wakes up, jasmine fragrant blooms, fluttering jerry blossoms, oak trees new green leaves, lazy afternoons, sun rays dance on quiet streets, cars nap by curbside, dogs and people stroll, but hastily cross the road in distancing mode. Yuzu greets her friends, I pull the leash to keep them many feet away. Cities at a pause, thoughts, secrets, unfinished loves are six feet under. Behind glass windows, we breathe in the silence of our befallen world. Omnipotently, trees rustle in mighty winds, Yuzu's daydreaming. Graph and charts play crucial roles in helping us to understand the fluctuating statistics. They visualize depth, not in actual images, but in numbers. We are now have become the faceless and nameless victims that we once encounter in our quick glance at the TV screen on news updates about wars in faraway places. Death has never been closer. Yet it's profoundly difficult to articulate feelings thoughts and reflection in such unprecedented times. I think our permeability, not in a biological membrane of neurons, but how we absorb situations and social conditions at times of calamities is an ongoing process. So data uh, and information gathering, uh, writing and art making can help to make sense of the incomprehensible and visualize the intangible. For me, I turn to those around me for inspiration and embrace sober observation through writing. 8.30 p.m. He grabs some coffee and goes, working through the night. Do you have face masks? Workers look at him and laugh. Where can we find them? No stimulus checks. An invisible workforce. We exist to serve. Socially apart, we dream and look to the sky in all four seasons. While Houston houses the fifth largest Central American immigrant population in the United States and is home to the third largest Vietnamese American community that came here as refugees. Um, unpacking the, co the complex experience of refugees and migrants with their contribution to society reminds us that the United States is built on the blood and sweat of immigrants and will continue to be that way. My sister's garage, a makeshift sweatshop these days, volunteer's office, 
Her dog sleeps and snores while the sewing machine roars, spewing out cloth masks. She recalls the past, crossing the threshold of life into adulthood by earning pennies, sweatshops, food courts, airports, blessings overflow. Grateful words uttered without a sound or a phrase, giving back gesture. She iron and packs thousands of colorful masks, hospitals, they go. Well, I will now turn the screen over to Kim for her reading. I muted, okay. I am going to start here. Um, and I just wanted to say that uh, what cut what in response to Tiffany uh, was this, I was, I'm in the middle of teaching two sculpture classes remotely to beginning students. And uh, the assignment I was giving was um, recording their sounds, the, the interior and exterior of their sounds. And so the soundscapes of lockdown and in fact, a lot of my lecture and a lot of their work is woven into this uh, as a kind of poetic response. So their prompt is actually um, translated into this kind of poetic that Tiffany initiated. Quotidian quarters, quarantine lives, we listen for the intonations of our own isolation. A pin drops, holding two pieces of fabric to suture and mask contagion and murmurs of our cloaked smile. We listen for the voices in our head singing a somber tenor of retreat or boredom or the fretful pitch between union and claustrophobia. Forms of interment are the terms of endearment encountered under one roof. Self-deportation, voluntary incarceration, Objects in the room speak in tongues, routines, Zoom chatter, the buzz of media, tales of care, of forced labor by the essential ones, the infirmed reaching out for unobstructed air. Out there, visibility clear. We have been here before. The rapture of exercising breath, footsteps, tracing the limits of our proximity or what fear sounds like or what fear sounds like six feet from another or the imagining six feet under.
Humanity in recession, an orchestrated diminuendo, the viral reckoning of scores, the wilding of borders and formerly occupied territories, terraforms. Interspecies cacophony, melodious rants, victory songs twitter over reclaimed landscapes, drowns our sonic memory of crowded places and planes no longer overhead. We hear as never before, and these songs of silent spring have changed us. Listen. Hog dressing, log cabin building, mountain crafts, planting by the signs, snake lore, hunting tales, faith healing, moon shining, Ghost stories, spring wild plant foods, spinning and weaving, midwifing, burial customs, corn shucking, wagon making. Tom, who lives near Bakeville, North Carolina, still carries on the craftsman tradition, making plow stocks, hoes, and tool handles. Animal care, butter churns, ginseng. Horse trading, sassafras tea, Gardening, bear hunting, wooden locks, a power sawmill, foot washing, ash glazes, churns, roosters. A prayer, praying rock, quilting, home cures, the log cabin revisited. The old home place, wild plant uses, preserving and cooking food, hunting stories, fishing, more affairs of plain living. And I'm going to come back in. Wow. Um, I really like your response. Uh, you know, one thing that, that, that has stick with me for all of this year um, is that, you know, your journey through the Grand Canyon um, is actually by bringing the ca Grand Canyon into a domestic environment and such a great landscape. And when I think about our collaboration and when I went through my own materials, just to think about the pandemic that we are going through, you know, I came across my, my work on environmental disaster and, and journeying through the sublime landscapes of, you know, but, I can only do that on a computer screen. And, and you know, you compellingly brought the Grand Canyon into your living room um, with, made by found materials many years ago. Can you, I mean, I love that work so much that I just wanted to make you talk about it. Well, that's interesting. Uh, you know, that, that saying about if you can't get somewhere, you bring it to you, right? And really that, the story of the, that Grand Canyon is actually, uh, my father had always wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. And when he passed, uh, you know, I felt this strong need to bring him to the Grand Canyon, even though he had already 
left this earth. And um, I, I metaphorically thought about all the years he had walked on this earth and how I could actually take his domestic space, the carpet he walked on, and then translate it back into the highest peaks of the Grand Canyon. So those are USGS maps made out of carpet um, of the highest peaks of the Grand Canyon. And uh, the piece was called Resuscitate and this notion of bringing life back to something that we think has passed or is gone. And it just changes forms. It just changes into different materials and different air. So that was really a commemoration to my father, but it was also a material exploration of bringing outside in and the inside to be much more expansive. Right. And what, you know, during our conversations, like many conversations that we've had, um, you know, you talk a lot about how my work kind of like reaching out globally, um, you know, in terms of scale, uh, which I've always wanted to do, um, not really looking at my own personal experience and, and just focusing on that, but expanding that and connecting my own history and the history of uh, the war in Vietnam and the exodus uh, in the post-1975 um, into the much larger global context. But, you know, but given this pandemic, right, we, we hear and we just kind of in our own little space and we all in it together. And I just, um, you know, I feel that your work focusing on the individuals have become, has become so much more important to me as well. Um, do you want to continue on that? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think, I think, uh, the, I, I guess I, I think about sort of, um, you know, I wake up in the morning thinking about the word less now and this notion of less is, is more, um, less heroic, less distance, less consumption, less grand, less fast, right? And how, and this like sort of bringing us in and sort of, you know, this, this forced stillness has, and, and you see that in the images that are in my surroundings, this kind of very, private and contemplative rumination over what it means to just be within our own footprint, right? Our own borders. And so I guess, um, you know, I had already been sort of, you know, as, as uh, my career took me more into really valuing where I lived and worked. Like I, I had traveled a lot. And there was always this sense that I was sort of a foreigner or kind of zooming in, doing something and moving out. And the idea of actually, um, when I worked in Shoppas as a volunteer, and then I left after six months, I realized that the work that needs to be done is right where I am. And therefore, you see my work has really turned to the students and the community, the immediate hyperlocal context of my surroundings. And so... I kind of have already sort of retreated into that. And I think it will be very interesting and in seeing sort of how your global, both geographic, physically and metaphorically work really does have this um, capacity to inform the local. You know, this is the thing that not just myself, but I think a lot of us in the art world have started to think, right? especially when air travel really puts you at risk. What do we do? So I think myself personally, I, I start to think about localizing my artistic practice. And I think even for institutional programs, right? What do you do when you can't fly artists all over the world uh, to you? I think it's time to, um, you know, invest into the local communities. And I think, you know, when we internalize the values of local communities and engage with them, um, or the outsourcing versus insourcing and making do what, what's available, 
I think those are all the things that, that we've been thinking about. But again, you know, it's just like we're like thinking out loud. Um, a lot of what we have written are fragmented or incomplete. You know, we just flesh out ideas. We just need to do it. Um, and, you know, the unprecedented challenges brought about by this pandemic really usher in new forms of collaboration and push us to just begin with whatever means we have. So I think that's how we started, right? We, we took forever to figure out how to start. Then we just like, okay, well, we will just start. And that's what we are at. Um, but one thing that I find quite impressive with, with your uh, work or your ways of living and, and also teaching is that sharing the knowledge and also, you know, learning from your students. Um, but it's, I think those, especially given the circumstance that we're in, is so much about, um, you know, the kind of resilience and survival skills, right? I think now we talk a lot about resilience. How do we, you know, how do we move on from here? So, yeah, and you know, what you just said about resilience and I, what, what kind of um, seeps into what I think about and the images of, the, the, of my father's tools and the fact that he saved string, you know, and, I, and then I saved it, which is, is the past is prologue. We have to look, we actually don't go back like the angel metaphor in Walter Benjamin but the past is a prologue and it is a guide and it does have instruction, you know, instructive, simple, and, and obviously even more so going back to um, indigenous knowledge, the, the earth and its lessons, you know, and so I'm really seeing that um, resiliency is within this turning back to, you know, uh, what is available, what is free what is sustainable, what is regenerative. Thus, you see, you know, all of the materials, the plant dyes, and those are the assignments I'm giving my students right now to work with hand tools, to dig holes in the earth, to, um, to make things with their hands uh, without technology and without uh, all the trappings of consumption. A lot of them only understand that they need to buy art supplies. And I, mm. I'm trying to turn them back to, no, these are the essential materials. Right. So it has a lot to do with vernacular knowledge, local yes. wisdom, right? So now we all have to really sit and reflect and think about what we can do. Like a lot of artists have uh, been outsourcing work, you know, yeah. like have big things produced in China. And I wonder how that will all play out now. Um, but one thing I think about a lot is that, you know, Walter Benjamin, I mean, I love Walter Benjamin. That's why I quote him a lot in my work, in my writing. Um, he wrote, uh, tra the tradition of the oppressed teaches us that the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. Right? So, wow, you, you know, a lot I he I've heard a lot about um, when we'll be back, when life will be back to normal. Right. And I think we just need to redefine what normal is. And we can only hope that life will return in this new normal. So and normal, yeah. Normal may yeah. not be as much as right. before. It may be able to be less than what, our former lives expected, right? And the, cons and the, the kind of um, vast uh, supply chain and, and, and economics that were involved in that. And I actually think we're now at this, in this moment where we can reimagine a different kind of economy based in values, um, based in our values rather than the market, maybe the gift economy, you know, and that's, um, Lewis Hyde, and this notion that if you thought of your work as a, in a different form, as something to give or barter, as opposed to 
sell and profit, right? And yet then I go to, well, how will artists survive? I mean, what, Mm -hmm. you know, how I have a teaching job. You know, if I didn't have this teaching job, I would not be perhaps so, uh, you know, presumptive about the economics of the gift economy. But I think there's something in that mode of operating that people are going to be very drawn to in this next um, iteration of art production. Um, I was just talking to an artist, Beatrice Cortez, who actually her, the people that help her make her work are, you know, often immigrant, but they also, she, she really takes care of them like part of her um, creative practice. And it's, it's a, it's a beautiful kind of economy that she's created uh, with herself and her uh, collaborators. So. Right. Um, Yeah. Do you think, you know, let, let's be really practical. I think we talked about how to do studio visit. I mean, a big, bar, a big part of, uh, of an artist's career or an art, artist's practice is to have studio visits because if you're just hiding um, in your studio and nobody can see what you do, um, what's the chance for your work to get exposure? So, you know, ask the teacher, um, if you are going to invite an artist to, to do, like before you would invite an artist to give a lecture at UC Santa Barbara, what would you do now? Well, we're actually, you know, part of the class that I'm doing is these remote studio visits with, um, with artists, uh, like Beatrice Cortez visited, uh, we visited her studio on Zoom. And while inferior in terms of embodied embodied experience, getting a sense of where she's, you know, quarantined in her, her domestic space, the work she's trying to do in that limited situation, um, actually gave a whole different dimension that changes even the concept, concept of what is professional, right? Mm -hmm. Like now that we're seeing all of us kind of in our domestic spaces as Mm -hmm. backdrops, or some of us in our studios, it actually has changed this whole notion of a kind of uh, way of being. And mm-hmm. so I think that it's opening up the porosity between one's personal space and that of, of your, your professional life and how those can actually enhance, right, our experience. But um, I mean, it, it certainly it made us all want to go see her studio and the uh-huh. huge <laughs> project she's working on for Rockefeller Center, right? A big rock, and so that was, um, you know, I think. Uh, but I think the the economics of not making that artist come all the way from another place and pay for the travel and the time and energy it takes really has to be weighed out. Mm-hmm. Right. So the remote can actually offset this this very precious and rare opportunity to be immersive, to be together really intensely, you know. And so I think it's going to be this kind of balance between the remote. This and then, you know, well, the, it has been quite challenging in has. terms of, you know, technical issues and all that. So it is going to be a lot that we have to continue to work out, to think about, and to to adapt to. Um, but what I have you. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. What were you, What are you thinking about, especially because your practice is so reliant on in person studio? Do you know what? Actually, since I moved to Houston, I I don't really have many studio visit um, from international visitors. Uh, compared to when I was living in Saigon mm. um, or even, you know, um, in, in Japan at one point. So um, I don't know, Kim. I mean, you know, I do what I, I continue to do what I always do, which is um, researching, um, writing, reflecting, writing, observing, writing, making work and just, you know, just just continue to do what I always do. And as a, a studio-based artist, it's not that much different. Uh, but of course, you know, um, under the lockdown, it has been tough 
for a lot of us, you know, we, a lot of shows got canceled um, or delayed um, until further notice. So we don't really know, there's a lot of uncertainties. But I think, you know, the silver lining from this pandemic is, it's, this is like so fiction-like and it's global. So we all in it together. And I think that we will emerge from this more prepared. You know, because tomorrow is already here. Many years ago, I did this project. Um, it was called Tomorrow Isn't Here. Of course, it discusses the wreckage of progress, um, referencing Walter Benjamin again. But this time, I, I actually, in my poetic writing, I said, tomorrow is here. But also another, you know, another piece of hope is that the angel of history actually able to awaken the dead because we are facing this pandemic now, right? So going back to what Benjamin wrote about the tradition of the oppressed and what it teaches us um, that, you know, the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. So therefore maybe through this crisis, we, we finally got a little glimpse of the everyday life in other parts of the world. So, so maybe we might not be able to travel the world the way we used to, but perhaps we understand and feel more connected to and care more for one another. I mean, that's, that's all I can hope for. I think um, um, this is really asking us to ask, what is essential? What, are, what is the essential things and ways of being are, you know, this kind of, um, I think it gets more parred, uh, parsed down into something, um, you know, s more spare and more simple. I keep going back to the less is more kind of metaphor of, um, you know, I frankly haven't done shopping for two weeks or, you know, really like I haven't, I've only done food shopping. Right. So all of that other stuff I've been doing, you know, of accumulating things, really, maybe I'm thinking I don't need to do that. I don't need to travel as much. I don't need to, you know, go to school as frequently back and forth. I mean, these are all things that we're all asking. And it'll be so interesting to see if people finally say, I will not do what I did before. I'm not going to make that commute that far that often. You know, it'll be very interesting to see how people's behavior is either intolerant of the way things were or welcoming back like the, the way things were you know yeah. I mean, you know yeah so well unfortunately you know a lot of people would have to make to commute to work in a long distance like some people commute for an hour and i don't know how to solve that issue so it's tough it's it's a challenge but i think you know we need to wrap it this up because there are questions coming in from the audience so i'm going to read the first questions and yeah uh, you can continue from there so the first question comes from maureen and it's for both of us uh kim okay what has been the single biggest logistical challenge to your creative process during isolation do you want to take a stab at that or uh, first or should I or go ahead? You go first. I, I need a moment to think. <laughs> OK, well, I'll be I think I sort of uh, jumped the gun, uh, uh, so to speak, about I have really changed the reach and scale and and grandiosity of my practice to be very much about my daily life, my exchange with students, my neighbor foraging for uh, available, uh, uh, food. Um, you know, it's all woven into this much more simpler footprint. And so I actually feel as though this situation has really, a, a, a kind of spurred a, a creative process in that what I was already doing that seemed like it was either home economics or craft is mm -hmm. actually part of an, a, a kind of new aesthetic of local right and so it actually feels as though i'm actually aligning more with a time than than i was before so that's how i i sort of feel like it it 
it feels like a necessity now doing mm -hmm. these basic things, you know? Wow. Well, for me to be really practical while well, the single biggest logistical challenge is that, you know, I have planned to, to continue to interview um, the Vietnamese Americans as a follow up on my uh, exhibition at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. But I can't interview people right now because of isolation. So I can't really ask people to come to me or I can't come to people. Even, you know, when the, I found a camera person who is just ready to do that with me. But uh, given the circumstance, you know, we have to be very careful and we have to keep social distance. So that has been challenging. Um, do you want to read the second question? Sure. Um, it's from the next question is from Jen. What impact is isolation and social distancing having on aspiring artists? and students. Um, I can certainly speak to the students and our grad students who are aspiring. Um, I can't even imagine how, how uh, you know, I mean, there are two, two ways to look at it. One is artists, if there are ever anyone who's better trained for uncertainty and failure and, and precarity, it's artists, you know, just by the way of their creative way of navigating through their work, is a skill set that I think best prepares an artist who is uh, open and um, fluid in the way in which they see the world and operate in it, as opposed to maybe somebody who had very clear goals and was sort of moving on a straight path towards them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying all art, all art, there can be very different kinds of artists, but I would say that the meandering path that sort of detours you in a direction may be the silver lining in the outcome, right? And artists are more predisposed to that. Whereas, you know, of course, if you set a goal and then something like this happens, it's going to completely undermine because you didn't have a plan B. You weren't like a jazz musician who just changed the, the key to your yeah. music or the beat. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. I think it's that kind of, um, anyway, that's sort of how I see the artist uh, and student. Yeah. Uh, is to to exercise creative navigation as the best skill set possible. Right. I think the most, I mean, the practical challenge is that I've heard a lot. I mean, of course, I have, a, I have experienced this kind of pause as well, but a lot of younger artists, you know, they might, they might have, like, they were about to have the first break in their career, like the first important exhibitions and everything suddenly um, is put on hold. I think that has been really difficult for a lot of artists. And we don't even know, I mean, museums don't even know when they can actually open again. And even if they open again, how do we keep the social distancing, right? How do we continue to, to embrace that so that nobody will be put at risk? Um, but anyways, I think I'm going to read the next question. Next question from Stuart is, um, for me, um, after the isolation and once we all got a green light, would you explore more places inside Texas for your work? And for Kim, in a similar vein, post-isolation, will you stay in the local mode or will you return to a broader view? So I will answer first. Um, that has always been my plan. Uh, now that I live in Houston, I've been here for, for almost three years. Um, I really want to get more involved, not just uh, within the art community, but also uh, in the you know, refugee community. I've already made some um, contact with, uh, with an organization that I, I want to volunteer to help. Um, and in, in terms of my artistic practice, yeah, it... I mean, everything I do uh, has always been, has always been, um, has always come from what inspire me, right? What I'm interested in exploring. So uh, that, that question is that the answer is definitely. Yeah, so um, uh, in, you know, I uh, stay local and return, uh, mine was, you know, am I going to stay local or am I going to, you know, run out of the, how screaming uh, for freedom, yes. But um, in terms of broader view, I think 
Um, I think that I just keep thinking about these questions as there are many ways to be an artist. I do, I mean, there are, there are you know, many ways in which we enact our, our creative self in the world. And I think for all of you moving out in the world, the fact that you can sort of kind of shape shift in these different situations, at times maybe you're a good listener or a witness, at other times you're you know, a proactive participant, I think that we have to get used to the idea that the world needs artists. They need you. Mm -hmm. And therefore you have to make yourself useful in your role in the world. And it may be um, not in the form of a museum, but it might be a balcony in Italy where you, where you perform for a public, right? Or you, I think you're gonna have to be reinventing the venues for a lot of your work, as will the institutions, which is extremely important that, you know, they, that's a big issue, the sustainability of our institutions, but yes. So for me, local and global, there's a great um, quote called intimate immensity. And I sort of see the macro in the micro, like the Grand mm -hmm. Canyon in my house. You know what I mean? So I right. don't have those, this is small, close, near proximity, and then out there is big. I have that, they, they kind of interchange. So and I think the next our question, world is forever altered. Yes. I don't think it's, it's the same anymore, right? Oh, definitely not. I, so, and so we have to actually be prepared question. to be unprepared. Um, actually, there's a, a good one for us um, from May. And she says, I'm so impressed by the collaboration ex and exchange. What do you do to keep your creative battery charged given everything going on? That's a great question. So. Tiffany. Ha, huh. well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not much we can really do outside of our immediate environment, which is our home. Um, but, you know, I think anxiety is inevitable and even hysteria in, is inevitable, but it's so important to be so, to stay sober to stay so clear, to stay, you know, positive. Because there's, there's no way around it. But as artists, yeah, I mean, we have to keep going. And like I mentioned earlier, most, a lot of artists are studio-based artists. So this is what we do. A lot of um, people might not know, but you know, being isolated is just a way of life for a lot of us. But I will say that, um, you know, the collaboration and exchange that we are beginning to explore mm -hmm. came about or had its opportunity in this very limited situation otherwise. So right. I think we're still in the impression stage, but just that that opened up that channel for us to actually have this initial collaboration is is something that may not have ever happened had we been charging along in our different spheres. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, we always have to see sort of the opportunity and the limits, right? Mm -hmm. That there is some sort of way forward. And so that charges me a lot. Um, the, mm -hmm. the, I look at the cup half full and say, now Tiffany and, I, Tiffany and I have had a meaningful exchange and we're hopefully going to be building it beyond this, maybe with work. I would love to collaborate in a different, in many different ways. Yeah. And so I think um, the working together mm -hmm. that the solo artist mm -hmm. is not always the solo artist is never really solo. Right. There's a whole infrastructure supporting that artist to make work. Mm -hmm. So now I think artists might think of themselves, the ones who were alone, more in a kind of community in some way, right. maybe. And also in terms of, you know, the creative uh, activities. It's, I have to admit, I can't just make work about what's going on in the world right now. I cannot make a visual artwork about that right now. It's still time to reflect, it's still time to absorb. Like I said, it's, it's an ongoing process and it's a very slow process. So I turn to writing. You know, I think everyone can write, right? Everyone can write poetry, I think. I'm not a poet, I'm not a, a writer by trade, but. That's and what I have I, to do. You, you just make do. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I mean, 
And yeah, I didn't course. expect to to respond in a poetic form, but it just you call that call to me, right? And I think that's really um, I just it it kind of touches upon a comment and question by Selena. Um, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Do you think these experiences due to COVID will change the roles of artists going forward? Uh, what do you think? Well, I think that might be the questions that you will have to answer to your students because I remember my training, right? The MFA school, I mean, MFA program that I uh, went through. It was a very different training that I had back then, right? About the art world and the, the economy of the art world and uh, what are we supposed to do to make it in the art world. You weren't baking bread, that's for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I think I think a lot of students might, you know, might wonder, especially graduate students, because they no longer kind of exploring like undergrad, right? They can just switch path and to go to a different uh, direction. But for MFA students, what what will yeah. you tell them? I mean, they were just getting ready for their final show and the museum's closed, you know, they can't. And so they've done a, a rem, an online uh, exhibition um, uh, and then they're doing a publication and they're sort of doing multiple forms to try and have that culmination. But um, I think, you know, when you've talked about research and writing and um, that that you're, you're, you're sort of broadening the, the kind of, um, forms and reach of your practice. Mm -hmm. so, so I think artists, if you think of yourself as being one kind of way of being in the world, that might feel limited. But if you can actually, I keep using the word shape shift, that you're, mm -hmm. you go outside and you're an artist, you know, and how you engage the world mm -hmm. is very much a kind of um, dry run always. So, you know, I think it's going to be a kind of more heightened. Um, consciousness uh, for the art, the roles for artists going forward of their critical role. The, the world desperately needs um, people with an imagination and the sense of possibility and an open mind. And that I think will be, you know, hopefully all of you who are young artists, we need you. <laughs> and Last I would question. Uh, Kim asks, how can the non-artistic of us facilitate art and artists in this time? Thank you so much for the question. It's so generous. Um, Do oh we need gosh. a moment to think? This is really, you know, Good I never question. got this question. Yeah. It's such a, such a generous question. Yeah, so I think I will say, I am not a believer that there, that I think people have aptitude and gifts and some are, have the calling to be artists. But I think no one is not an artist, not artistic, okay, and not a creative person. And so the best you can do for the artist is to um, is to work with them and be with them. And you know, yes, of course, I don't think it's a one-way street. In other words, the non-artists support the artists. You know, the rich people support the artists. It's it's a dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, we artists need dialogue with refugees, with neighbors, with, um, you know, uh, um, uh, field workers, with academics, right? We need that dialogue to fuel our work. So just being in conversation and being a, a brainstorm, a sounding board, I think is, is calling upon you to be the, the artist that you are as well in the in the conversation you know what i mean we i don't see it as we're special you know well of course we're not special and i don't believe in a special calling either but what i can say is that i have seen um the so-called non-artists a, a lot of a lot of them have been you know volunteering working in museums a lot of you know when i do projects or research in in other countries there's a lot of volunteers help me to, you know, facilitating meetings or translating and providing a space for us to meet and talk. I mean, there's so much support that artists have been getting from 
the audience or from the non-artists. Um, I think the, the so-called non-artists have been doing a lot for us and, and the, you know, the home volunteering system as much as I think is just not fair. I think it just comes out from, from such a good place, from such kindness of the people that believe in what we do and offer us that kind of support system. I think it's so important. And I'll just say that I believe in the exchange, the exchange of not one way give, but that we also give something back. Of we, course, we, you yeah. know, and so that exchange, I think is probably the best way to think about the artist, non-artist is a dialogue, right? And that seems like a perfect place to um, to end this, co end this conversation. Uh, fun conversation that we could actually go on and on over. <laughs> well, well, Kim, you and I will keep going. <laughs> I know. In it's a, it's a deal. Yes. So it's really nice uh, that we'd be we able to do this together. And thanks again to Bridges and Asia Society and everyone to Thank really you for give inviting. us this opportunity. Thank Just, you, Tiffany. Thank you, Bridget. I want to repeat again our immense gratitude to both of you for sharing such great wisdom and inspiration with all of us on the on the meeting tonight. It's really been just so enlightening. Uh, we're delighted that you could all be together. I really love the observation about this idea of elasticity of scale as we move between outside and inside, mm -hmm. the historical and the personal and the individual and the collective. And just, uh, you know, for us to all go away this evening and think about what is essential. I think that uh, that's something that we can all muse on for quite a bit. So a huge thank you again. And I hope if you're in the audience, um, you've really derived a lot uh, to consider from what Kim and Tiffany shared. I do also hope that you'll continue to tune in for future webcasts. Uh, this Thursday at 7.30, we have Coping with the Stress of COVID-19. So I think there'll be insights for everyone to I'm take signing from that. Up. Yeah, exactly. We'll all be there together. <laughs> um, Film Fest Voices of Asia is going to be Friday, this Friday at 7.30. And then again, in terms of restoring and recharging the battery on Saturday at noon, we're offering a Qigong retreat. Wow. Um, so all available through YouTube and our website. Please come back and join us. But again, Tiffany and Kim, thank you so much for making time to share with our audience. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, you. Bye. Bye See Tiffany. You. <laughs> thank you. Thanks.